Sophie calls to ask, am I going by the anarchist convention this year? The year before last, I'm missing because Brickman, may he rest in peace, was on the committee and we were feuding. I think about the Soviet dissidents, but then there was always something, so it's hard to say. Then last year, he was just cooling in the grave and it would have looked bad. There's Leo Gold, they would have said, come to gloat over Brickman. So I tell Sophie, maybe, depending on my hip. Rainy days, it's torture. There isn't a position, it doesn't throb. Rainy days and election nights. But Sophie won't hear no, she's still got the irons, Sophie. Knows I won't be caught, be, I won't be caught dead on the senior shuttle, so she arranges a cab and says, but Leo, don't you want to see me? Been using that one for over 50 years. Worked again. We used to have it at the New Yorker Hotel before the Korean and his Jesus children moved in. You see him on the streets peddling flowers, big smiles, cheeks glowing like Hitler Youth, high on the opiate of the people. Used to be the New Yorker had its dopers, its musicians, its sad sacks and marginal types. We felt at home there. So this year the committee books us with the chain that our religious friends from Utah own, their showpiece there on Central Park South, which kicks off the annual difficulties. That's the bunch killed Joe Hill, comes the cry. Corporate holdings to rival the Pope, they say, and we're off to the races. Personally, I think we should have it where we did the year the doormen were on strike, should rent the Union Hall in Brooklyn. But who listens to me? So right off the bat, there's Pinkstaff working up a petition and Weiss organizing a counter committee, always with the factions and the splinter groups, those two. Whatever drove man to split the atom is the engine that rules their lives. Not divide and conquer, but divide and subdivide. First thing in the lobby, we've got Weiss passing a handout on Brigham Young and the Mountain Meadow Massacre. Leo Gold, he says, I thought you were dead. It's a matter of days. You never learned to spell, Weiss. What? Spelling. I point to the handout. Who is this Norman? Norman hierarchy, Norman elders. And all this capitalization, it's cheap theatrics. Weiss has to put on his glasses. Oh, that's not spelling, he says. That's typing. Spelling, I'm fine, but these new machines... My granddaughter bought an electric. Oh, it's nice she lets you use it. Well, she doesn't know. I sneak when she's at school. Next, there's the placard in the lobby. Welcome anarchists. And the caricature of Bakunin, complete with a sizzling bomb in hand. That Gross can still hold a pen is such a miracle we have to indulge his alleged sense of humor every year. A malicious man, Gross, like all cartoonists. Grinning, watching the hotel lackeys stew in their little brown uniforms, wondering is it a joke or not. Personally, I think it's in bad taste, the bomb-throwing bit. It's the enemy's job to ridicule, not ours. But who asks me? They've set us loose in something called the Elizabethan Room, and it's a sorry sight. A half hundred old crackpots tiptoeing across the carpet, wondering how they got past the velvet ropes and into the exhibit. That old fascination with the enemy's lair. They fit like fresh kishka on a silk sheet. Some woman I don't know is pinning everyone with name tags. So immediately the ashtrays are full of them, pins bent by palsied fingers. Name tags at the anarchist convention. Pearl is here, and uh, Bill Kinney in a fog, and Lou Randolph, and Pinkstaff, and Fine, and Diamond tottering around, flashing his new store bots at everyone. Personally, wearing dentures, I would try to keep my mouth shut. But then I always did. Leo, we thought we'd lost you, they say. Not a word, it's two years. Thought you went just after Brickland, rest his soul. So you haven't quit yet, Leo. I tell him it's a matter of hours and I look for Sophie. She's by Baker, the committee chairman this year. Always the committee chairman. He's the only one with such a streak of masochism. Sophie's by Baker and there's no sign of her Mr. Gillis. There's another one, makes the hip, hip act up. Two or three times I've seen the man since he set up housekeeping with Sophie, and every time I'm in pain. Like an allergy, only bone deep. It's not just TCP from the word go. We all had a fling with a party, and they have their point of view. But uh, Gillis is the sort that didn't hop off Joe Stalin's bandwagon until after it nosedived into the sewer. The deal with Berlin wasn't enough for Gillis, or the purges, no, nor any of the other tidbits that started coming out from reliable sources. Not till the party announced officially that Joe was off the sainted list did Gillis catch a whiff. And him with Sophie now. Oh, maybe he's a good cook. She lights up when she sees me. After all these years, that smile on my knees are water. 
She hasn't gone the Mother Jones route, Sophie. No shawls and spectacles. She's nobody's granny on a candy box. She's thin, a uh, strong thin, not like diamond. In her eyes, they still stop your breath from across the room. Always there was such a crowd, such a crowd around Sophie. And always she made each one think he was at the head of the line. Leo, you came. I was afraid you'd be shy again. She hugs me and tells Baker I'm like a brother. Sophie, who always rallied us after a beating, who bound our wounds, who built our pride back up from shambles and never faltered a step. The iron she had. In Portland, they're shaving her head, but no wig for Sophie. She wore it like a badge. And the fire toe-to-toe -to -toe with a fat Biloxi deputy, head-to-head -head with a Hoboken wharf boss, starting a near riot from a soapbox in Columbus Circle, but shaping it, turning it, stampeding all that anger and energy in the right direction. Still the iron, still the fire, and still it's Leo, you're like a brother. Baker is smiling his little pained smile, looking for someone to apologize to. Blum is telling jokes. Vic Lewis has an aluminum walker after a stroke. And old Mrs. Axelrod, who knew Emma Goldman from the garment workers, is dozing in her chair. Somebody must be in charge of bringing the old woman with her mind the way it is because she never misses. She's our museum piece, our link to the past. Not that the rest of us qualify for the new left. Bud Odom is in one corner trying to work up a sing-along, 15 years younger than most here, a celebrity, still with the denim open at the chest and the Greek sailor cap. The voice is shot, though. With Harriet Foote and old Lieber joining, they sound like the look for the union label folks on television, determined but slightly off-key. The younger kids aren't so big on Bud anymore. The hootenanny generation is grown with other fish to fry. Kids... The room is crawling with little bonnet girls in the tape recorders, pestering people for oral history. A pair can't buy Miss Axelrod, clicking on whenever she starts awake and mutters some Yiddish. Sophie, who speaks as she's raving about the harness eyes breaking and the shackles bouncing on the floor, some shirt factory tangle in her mind. Gems, they think they're getting, oral history gems. They're starting to be Rebecca's again, and little the little Barnard girls, uh, and Sarah's and Esther's, after decades of Carol, Debbie, and Sally. The one who tapes me is a Razala, which was my mother's name. We're trying to preserve it, she says with a sweet smile for an old man. What, Yiddish? I don't speak. No, she says, anarchism, the memories of anarchism, uh, now that it's served its dialectical purpose. Oh, I say, you're a determinist. She gives me a look. They think we never opened the book. I don't tell her I've written a few. It wouldn't make an impression. If it isn't on tape or film, it doesn't register. Put my name in the computer, you draw a blank. Razala, I say. That's a pretty name. I learned it from an exchange student. I used to be Jody. Dinner is called and there's confusion. There's jostling. Everyone wants near the platform. The ears aren't what they used to be. There is a seating plan with place cards set out, but nobody looks. Place cards at the anarchist convention? I manage to squeeze in next to Sophie. First on the agenda is fruit cup, then speeches, then dinner, then more speeches. Carmen Marcovici wants us to go get our own fruit cup. It makes her uneasy, she says, being waited on. People want, they should get up and get it themselves. A couple minutes of mumble grumble, then someone points out that we'd be putting the two hotel lackeys in charge of the meal out of a job. It's agreed, they'll serve. You could always reason with Carmen. Then Harriet Foote questions the grapes in the fruit cup. The boycott is over, we tell her. Grapes are fine. In fact, grapes were always fine. It was the labor situation that was no good, not the fruit. Well, I'm not eating mine, she says, blood pressure climbing toward the danger point. It would be disloyal. The wrath of the people. That's what Brickman used to call it in his articles, in his harangues, in his three-hour walking diatribes. Harriet still has it in Carmen and Weiss and Sophie and Bill Kinney on his clear days and Brickman, Brickman had it to the end. It's a wonderful quality, but when you're over 70 and haven't eaten since breakfast, it has its drawbacks. Baker speaks first, apologizing for the sight and the hour and the weather and the Hundred Years' War. He congratulates the long travelers, Odom from L.A., Kinney from Montana, Pappas from Chicago, Mrs. Axelrad all the way from Yonkers. He apologizes that our next scheduled speaker, Mikey Dolan, won't be with us. He apologizes for not having time to prepare a eulogy, but it was so sudden. More mumble-grumble, this being the first we've heard about Mikey. 
Sophie is crying, but she's not the sort you offer your shoulder or reach for the Kleenex. If steel had tears, Brickman used to say. Uh, they had their battles, Brickman and Sophie, those two years they were together, 37 and 38. Neither of them known as a compromiser, both with healthy throwing arms. Once a month there's a knock and it's Sophie come to borrow more plates. I worked for money at the movie house. I always had plates. The worst, of course, was when you wouldn't see either of them for a week. Phil Rapp was living below them, and you'd see him in Washington Square, 8 o'clock in the morning. Phil, who'd sleep through the revolution itself if it came before noon. I can't take it, he'd say. They're at it already, in the morning, in the noontime, at night. At least when they're fighting, the plaster doesn't fall. Less than two years it lasted, but of all of them, before and after, it was Brickman left his mark on her. That hurts. Bud Odom is up next, his Wisconsin accent creeping toward Oklahoma, twanging on about good, red-blooded American men and women, and I get a terrible feeling he's going to break into the ballad of Bob La Follette when war breaks out at the far end of the table. In the initial shuffle, Ali Zates was sitting down next to Fritz Grow, and it's 15 minutes before the shock of recognition. Ali has lost all of his hair from x-ray treatments, and Fritz never had any. More than ever, they're looking like twins. You, says Ali. You from the dock workers, and you from that yellow rag, they haven't put you away from civilized people? They let you in here? You an anarchist? In the fullest definition of the word, which you wouldn't know. What was that coloring book you wrote for? At the top of their voices, in the manner of old lefties, what well, old, in the manner we've always had, damn the decibels and full speed ahead. Baker would apologize, but he's not near enough to the microphone, and Bud Odom is just laughing. There's still something genuine about the boy, Greek sailor cap and all. Who let this crank in here? We've been infiltrated. Point of order, point of order. What Ali is thinking from point of order, I don't know, but the lady from the name tags gets them separated, gives each a Barnard girl to record their spewings about the other. Something Fritz said at a meeting, something Ali wrote about it centuries ago. We don't forget. Bud gets going again, and it seems that last year they weren't prepared with uh, Brickman's eulogy, so Bud will do the honors now. I feel eyes swiveling, a little muttered chorus of Leo, Leo, Leo goes through the room. Sophie knew, of course, and conned me into what she thought would be good for me, once again. First, Bud goes into what a fighter Brickman was, tells how he took on Union City, New Jersey, single-handed, about the time he organized an entire truckload of scabs with one speech, turning them around right under the company's nose. He can still rouse an audience spot, even with the pipes gone, and soon they're popping up around the table with memories. Little Pappas, who we never thought would survive the beating he took one May Day scuffle, little one-eyed, broken-nosed Papa stands and tells of Brickman saving the mimeograph machine when they burned our office on 27th Street. And Sam Carnes, ghost pale like the years in prison, bleached even his blood is standing, shaky with the word on Brickman's last days. Tubes running out of him, fluids dripping into him. Still, Brickman agitates with the hospital orderlies, organizes with the cleaning staff. Then Sophie takes the floor, talking about spirit, how Brickman had it, how Brickman was it, spirit of our cause. More spirit sometimes than judgment, and again I feel the eyes, hear the Leo, 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 and there I am on my feet. We had our troubles, I say, Brickman and I, but always I knew his heart was in the right place. Applause, tears, and I sit down. It's a sentimental moment. Of course, it isn't true. If Brickman had a heart, it was a well-kept secret. He was a machine in an express train flying the black flag. But it's a sentimental moment. The words come out. Everybody is making nice then. The old friendly juice is flowing. And Baker, Baker has to bring up business. A master of tact, a genius of timing, a vote. Do we elect next year's committee before dinner or after? Why spoil dinner, says one camp. Nobody will be left awake after, says the other. Let's get it out of the way. They always started small, the rifts. A title, a phrase, a point of procedure. The Chicago fire began with a spark. But it pulls the scab off. The old animosities, bickerings come back to the surface. One whole section of the table splits off into a violent debate over the merits of syndicalism. Another forms a faction for elections during dinner. Weiss wrestles Baker for the microphone, and Sophie shakes her head sadly. 
Why, why, why? Always they argue, she says. Always they fight. I could answer, I devoted half of one of my studies to it, but who asks? While the argument heats, another little girl comes over with used to be Jody. She says, you're Leo Gold. I confess. The Leo Gold? There's another? I ran, I read Anarchism and the Will to Love. My one turkey and she's read it. Ah, I say, so you're the one. I didn't realize you were still alive. It's a matter of seconds. I'm feeling low, veins are standing out in temples, old hearts straining, distemper epidemic. And the sound, that sound familiar but with a new feudal edge. I've never been uh, detached enough to recognize the sound so exactly before. It's a raw throated sound, a grating insistent sound, a sound born out of all the insults swallowed, the battles lost, out of all the smothered dreams and desires. 3,000 collective years of frustration in that room, turning inward, a cancer of frustration. It's the sound of parents brawling each other because they can't feed their kids. The sound of prisoners preying on each other because guards are out of their reach. The sound of a terribly deep despair. No quiet desperation for us, not while we have a voice left. Over an hour at last, the sniping, the shouting, the accusations, the counter charges. I want to eat, I want to go home, I want to cry. And then the hotel manager walks in. Brown blazer, $20 haircut, and a smile from here to Salt Lake City. A huddle at the platform. Baker and Mr. Manager bowing and scraping at each other. Bud Odom looking grim, Weiss turning colors. Sophie and I go up, followed by half the congregation. Nobody trusts to hear it secondhand. I can sense the sweat breaking under the blazer when he sees us coming. Toothless, gnarled, suspicious by habit, ringing around him, the anarchist convention. A terrible mistake, he says. All my fault, he says. I'm awfully sorry, he says. But you'll have to move. Seems the Rotary Club, the Rotary Club from Sioux Falls, had booked this room before us. Someone misread the calendar. They're out in the lobby, uh, eyeballing Bakunin, impatient, full of gin and boosterism. Uh, we have a nice room, a, a smaller room, coos the manager. We can set you up there in a jiffy, much less drafty than this room. I'm sure the older folks would feel more comfortable. I think it stinks, says Rosenthal, every year the committee treasurer. We paid cash, the room is ours. Rosenthal doesn't believe in checks. The less the Wall Street boys handle your money, he says, the cleaner it is. Who better to be a treasurer than a man who thinks gold is filth? That must be it, says Sophie to the manager. You've got your cash from us, money in the bank. You don't have to worry. The Rotary, they can cancel a check so you're scared. And maybe there's a little extra on the side they give you, a little folding green to clear out the riffraff. Sophie has him blushing, but he's going to the wire anyway, like Frick in the homestead strike. Shot, stomped, and stabbed by Alexander Berkman. They patch him up, and he finishes his day at the office. A gold star from Carnegie. Capitalism's finest hour. You'll have to move, says the manager. Dreams of corporate glory in his eyes, the smile hanging onto his face by its fingernails. It's the only way. Never, says Weiss. Out of the question, says Sophie. Fuck off, says Pappas. Pappas saw his father lynched. Pappas did three hard ones in Leavenworth. Pappas lost an eye, a lung, and his profile to a mob in Chicago. He says it with conviction. Pardon? A note of warning from Mr. Manager. He says the fuck off, says Fritz Grow. You hide him, says Alizates. If you people won't cooperate, huffs the manager, condescension rolling down like a thick mist, I'll have to call in the police. It zings through the room like the twinge of a single nerve. Police? They're sending the police, cries Pingstaff. Go limp, cries Vic Lewis, knuckles white with excitement on his walker. Make them drag us out. Mind the shuttles, mind the shuttles, cries old Mrs. Axelrod in Yiddish, sitting straight up in her chair. Allie Zates is on the phone to a newspaper friend. The Barnard girls are taping everything in sight. Sophie is organizing us into squads, and only Baker holding Weiss bodily allows Mr. Manager to escape the room in one piece. We're the anarchist convention. 
Nobody bickers, nobody stalls or debates or splinters. We managed to turn the long table around by the door as a kind of barricade, stack the chairs together in a second line of defense and crate Mrs. Axelrod back out of harm's way. I stay close by Sophie and once lugging the table, she turns and gives me that smile. Like a shot of adrenaline, I feel 50 again. Sophie, Sophie, it was always so good just to be at your side. And when the manager returns with his two befuddled street cops to find us standing together, arms linked, the lame held up out of their wheelchairs, the deaf joining from memory as Bud Odom leads us and we shall not be moved, my hand and Sophie, sweaty palm that are touched like the old days. I look at him in his brown blazer and I think, Brickman, I think, my God, if Brickman was here, we'd show this bastard the wrath of the people.